everyone. May we all stand to our feet. And we will begin our singing with I Want That Mountain. We'll sing the first and last verse of I Want That Mountain. standing for prayer and the Lord gave us a wonderful service this morning and uh, it was great to be in God's house and all of our Sunday school classes functioning and and our main service and uh, and it was good to also have uh, Vicki come forward and join the church and I thought I saw her I think she's here again tonight there she is and uh, it was also good to have some visitors as well it's good to have with us Phyllis this morning and she's back this evening amen and my wife and I got to know her a little bit better this afternoon. And uh, they, they went over to our house for lunch. And so got to know her a little bit. And a wonderful lady. And uh, Phyllis, a great person. There's just one thing. There's just one thing. She only has one flaw that I can, I can tell. Just one flaw. How many White Sox fans do we have in here? Raise your hand. Look at this. Look around, Phyllis. Look around. Actually, I'm way outnumbered here in this church. But she is a White Sox fan. The only, only thing I have against her. Everything else, fantastic. But, uh, <laughs> oh, Brother James says he was going to try to win her, convert her, right? <laughs> but uh, Brother Jeff says, no, no, stay where you are. Actually, there are more White Sox fans in this church than there are Cub fans. So you, you, you would feel at home. But anyway, it's uh, good to get to know her and uh, a great service this morning. And we're looking for, uh, for what God has to do th this evening, what he will do. Let's bow for prayer and then we'll have another song. And then we're going to see highlights from this year's youth conference. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it, it, Lord, is always a joy to be in your house. And Father, I, I pray once again that you would meet with us in a special way. Pray for your presence. Pray for your power. Pray, Father, that you would anoint the preaching and that you would bless all that is said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Lift up our voices again. He leadeth me. We'll sing the first and last verse of He leadeth me.
Brother Abe, if he'd come to the platform. Where's Brother Abe at? And uh, working on the, the, uh, in the sound booth there. By the way, we want to apologize for some of the glitches this morning uh, with the sound system and so forth. We had some glitches, and there was a delay. I guess if you were in the fellowship hall, you heard a delay and uh, with, the, uh, with the voices and so forth. And, but Brother Abe worked on that, uh, but we do, uh, we do apologize for any of those uh, uh, glitches, and sometimes that happens. Brother Abe said, uh, he said, anything that could have gone wrong with the uh, sound system uh, went wrong this morning, <laughs> and, uh, but I think we've got things uh, a little bit better tonight. Brother Abe's going to come. He's going to talk a little bit about the youth conference, and then uh, he's going to show us some highlights. Thank you, Pastor. All right. So, as I mentioned this morning, this uh, year was very, very different uh, feeling in terms of the youth conference. Um, virtual youth conference, never thought I'd see the day, but uh, here it was. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, folks, I prayed a long time that this would be uh, a good conference and enjoyable for the young people. I know that uh, Northwest was going to do their absolute best to do a great job, but they really exceeded my expectations in terms of what they were able to do. Um, you know, the preaching was phenomenal, and then the activities that they were able to do, which, you know, youth conference activities are a big deal. So the activities that they were able to do were a lot of fun. Uh, so in just a second, you're going to see some video highlights. Just to give you some context here, our church was one of 14 to 16 churches that took part in this conference and churches all across the country uh, ranging in size from smaller than ours to a church like the size of Northwest in Elgin or uh, Faith Baptist in Bourbon A. Uh, so for us to win as much as we did right. feels really, really good. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it just feels a little bit better when you know that you have some stiff competition. So, uh, anyway, really proud of the young people uh, and their attitude throughout. They were uh, excited and uh, just, you know, ready to be a part of things. I uh, didn't have to, you know, kick them to get them going. Uh, they actually wanted to, you know, as usual, do more than I wanted to. But uh, uh, I think I kept up with them pretty well. But um, anyway, the activities were really, really great. What you're going to see uh, are highlights from the very first day. Uh, we did the video scavenger hunt. So we had to go all around Lockport and the surrounding area and either take pictures of various things or get certain things on video. Ridiculous things like getting a gas receipt for 11 cents at a, at a gas pump, right? Um, do, in jumping in a river, which you'll see in a second. Uh, fake kung fu fight on a, on a busy street corner. So anyway, we had to get all those videos. We got all those in. We ended up taking, I think, sixth place in the video scavenger hunt, which was not that bad. Uh, but then the next day... Uh, we have highlights from the Bible trivia that we did in the morning and then also the survival adventure game, which you all are going to see. And uh, that, again, we had a theme that we were stranded on a remote island and that each of the young people, and then including myself, we all had a role that we had to play in our little community. So there was a fire specialist known as the pyro, right? There was a chef, there was a medic. There was a cartographer, there was a chaplain, that was me. Um, and so we each took on a different role and we got 12 challenges that we all had to perform. And then we sent in a video of that and we got rated real time on our survival skills, our creativity. And uh, we either got four or five stars on every challenge that we did uh, for a final average score of 4.5 and uh, we ended up taking that competition. So that was really great to see. But again, folks, thank you so much for your prayers. I really appreciate it. A conference like that uh, doesn't go off as smoothly as it did uh, without a lot of prayers from God's people. And I know the parents of those that had young people at the conference as well definitely prayed. So thank you so much. You each had a part in this in some way, shape, or form. And uh, Josh, you have the video queued up. We're gonna go ahead and watch the video. Let's give uh, the gentleman a second to get off the platform. And take it away.
Hello everyone out there in virtual youth conference land. My name is Brother Abe Shea, and uh, we are bringing you greetings from Grace Baptist Church in Lockport. I wanted to have my youth group give you all a quick introduction, so here we go. Angel. Kelly. John. Madison. Izzy. Max. Tori. Tanner. <laughs> Looking forward to a good week. Go. Let me see him in there. In. Kelly, come on in. It's Corona season. Right, I have right, to be protected. Wait, hold on, watch out. To your right. To your right. To your right. right. Okay, that right. This way. This way. Which way? Straight forward. Follow my voice. Follow my voice. Keep coming. Keep coming. Oh, you? Oh, you? Marry me? Why? No. I won't. What do you think? Seven in here. We don't have a boat, but this is the best we got. Go for it. Row. Okay, this is. <laughs> Row. Put Kevin in there. What about she going there? Extra bonus. Look at me. Okay, there. That was. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight. So this is Kevin, our carpenter, that orchestrated the building of this uh, tremendous shelter. We have these uh, sticks here as a deterrent to would-be attackers. We have an alarm system of sorts. We have some uh, shrubbery to uh, camouflage. We actually just had a storm here and it is nice and dry inside this shelter. Well done, Kevin, well done. Giant beetle, nice and roasted. Yeah. Here we go. I'll go for it. Yeah, I heard a crunch. All right. Well, at least you'll survive. <laughs>
Does that Bible have your fingerprints on its pages from turning them as you read it? Does that Bible have your fingerprints on its pages as you turn to the text the preacher announces for his message? Does that Bible have words underlined or words written in the margin from where you made a note about something you wanted to remember as you read your Bible? And my question is this, is that your sword? Good. I've never seen Madison so happy in my life. I thought, man, that was great. All right, may we all stand to our feet and we will sing Sunshine in the Soul. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. much and uh, I myself I was wondering how that youth conference was going to turn out a virtual youth conference uh, first time I've ever been involved in something like that and all the years that I've been a Christian and all the years that I've been in ministry and uh, you know it really went well it really did now there's nothing like actually being there obviously that's that's better but uh, uh, at least it was uh, something and the preaching was great had some tremendous preaching throughout the week uh, decisions made among our young people and young people that were watching and and that were actually there as well uh, and I appreciate brother Abe and, and miss Mandy and all the hard work they did and all the time they spent with the young people for three solid days uh, day and night and uh, meals and fellowship and games and of course all the preaching and the services and so forth and uh, it really went well I was very pleased all right this time we'll take our Bibles let's all stand to our feet I'm gonna ask uh, brother Larry if he'll come and lead us in our scripture and then we'll get into the message tonight all right please open your Bibles to the book of Revelations chapter 1 Revelation chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> I'll begin with verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him 
to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we've seen, Lord, and reminded, it's been a great week here at Grace Baptist Church. And thank you, Lord, for all the decisions that were made and the testimonies, Lord. Lord, uh, we begin a new week, and Lord, we, we want to make more decisions. And Lord, we, we pray that you just continue to bless tonight, bless the preaching of your word. Pray that you'd use Pastor Harrison now. And uh, Lord, hide him behind the cross, and Lord, help us as we uh, as we listen, Lord, with intent. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you, Brother Larry. You may be seated. Let's have our Bibles open to Revelation chapter 1, and there we will stay. And I want to preach a simple message tonight on the subject, Jesus in Revelation 1. Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. Uh, the book of Revelation is one of my favorite books out of the 66 books in the Bible. I have a lot of favorite books, but this is definitely one of them. If I were to choose probably uh, five books out of the Bible that would be my favorite, this would definitely be one. And chapter 1 of Revelation is one of my favorite chapters in the Word of God. And when it comes to preaching, there is no better topic then the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never go wrong preaching about Jesus. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do tonight. So we see here in Revelation chapter 1, uh, it's about Jesus and it provides us this opportunity to just talk about the Lord and to exalt Him tonight and lift Him up because He is worthy. Heavenly Father, we need You. We ask for Your power we ask, Father, that you would speak to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit have liberty and may the Holy Spirit do what he needs to do in our hearts. I pray that he will convict us. I pray that he will uh, encourage us and comfort us and challenge us. And Lord, may our ears and eyes and minds be open and more than that, our hearts. And Father, I pray you do great work tonight. May decisions be made because of this simple message, uh, but Lord, what a great message this is from Revelation chapter 1, and we ask this and pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps the greatest description of Jesus is found in this very chapter, Revelation chapter 1. In this chapter, we see who He is, what He has done, what He will do, and what he looks like. I want to begin with who he is. Who is Jesus according to Revelation chapter 1? I want you to look at verse 5 with me. Look at Revelation 1, 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And go down to verse 8, if you will. Look at verse 8. We see another description of Jesus. He says this about Himself. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord. Now go down to verse number 11, if you will, uh, saying, once again, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I want you to look again in verse number 5. We see who Jesus is. In the first part of verse 5 it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. The faithful witness. Jesus is called 
the faithful witness. Now, what is a witness? Well, a witness tells what he has seen or what he has heard. A witness is someone that has, uh, has seen something, and he goes and he tells it and he describes it. Jesus is called the faithful witness. A faithful witness is one whose testimony is reliable every time. Amen. He is called the faithful witness. You see, we can count on everything that Jesus says. Not only are His words true, but He is true. In fact, Jesus is called the truth. We find that in John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the what? And the truth. Jesus, not only are His words true, but He Himself is true true. In John chapter 1 verse 7 it says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that through all men or that all men through him might believe. The faithful witness who is Jesus Christ has called you and I as born again Christians to also be faithful witnesses. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said to his disciples, not just to them, but to all of us, in Acts 1, 8, he said, Ye shall be witnesses. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, he said, And we, it says this, And we are his witnesses of these things. Let me ask you tonight, are you a faithful witness? We know He is the faithful witness. What He says is always true, and it is always reliable. He is the witness of the light. He is the witness of the Father. He is the witness of truth. But are you a faithful witness? Are you uh, the kind of witness who tells the truth? Are you a faithful witness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you faithful to tell others about the gospel and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. You see, the faithful witness is counting on you to be a faithful witness for Him and for the gospel's sake. I hope you're a witness. I hope that you uh, uh, are not afraid to tell people about Jesus. I hope that you're, uh, that you're uh, bold enough and have enough compassion and love for the Lord that you tell people. Amen? Amen. I mean, at the workplace, in the neighborhood at school, uh, in family gatherings, wherever you might be. I hope you're telling people the good news. And I'll tell you what, we live in a day, we live in a time where we can all use good news. Amen? You turn on the television, you turn on the radio, you, you get on social media, and it seems like it's all bad news, doesn't it? It gets discouraging. And, but I want to say that the world needs to hear good news. And good news is the gospel. That good news is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and He rose again. And He's alive forevermore. And He is the Savior of the world. Are you telling people that? Are you, are you a faithful witness for Him? And, you know, some people, some Christians say, well, you know... Pastor, I'm just not a very good talker. You know, I, I'm just kind of shy and timid. I don't know what to say to people. I don't have, a, you know, the verses memorized that you're supposed to have and all that. Uh, did you know that, that all you have to do is just tell somebody what Jesus did for you? Amen? That's called a testimony. If you are saved tonight, you have a personal testimony of how Jesus saved you. And you know what? That's really all you need to tell somebody about Jesus. Now, I'm for memorizing Scripture. I'm for gospel plans. I'm for the Romans road and all of that. And I use those things often when I witness to folks and, and, and uh, give people the gospel. But you know what? Probably the thing I use more than anything else, after all these years, over 50 years I've been saved, and going on 38 years full-time in the ministry, I still use my personal testimony more than any other thing to witness to people. And my testimony isn't that, uh, that bombastic. Uh, it isn't uh, that earth-shaking. 
Uh, I just tell people how uh, when I was a 10-year-old boy, I rode a bus to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, and how I heard that I was a sinner, and I heard that there's a, a penalty for sin, and I heard that, that God uh, uh, provided the payment for my sin by sending His only Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sins. And I heard how He was buried and rose again. And as a 10-year-old boy, I bowed my heart and asked Jesus to come in and save me. And He did. He forgave me of all my sins, and He saved my soul. That's my testimony. It isn't earth-shaking, but you know what? It's my testimony. And uh, it's how I got saved. And I like to share that with people. I still do all the time. And uh, we need to be faithful witnesses. He is the faithful witness. Are you a faithful witness? I realize the importance of being a witness as a teenager. When I was 16 years of age, I won my first soul to Jesus Christ. I won one of my friends in the cafeteria of the public high school that I attended at that time. And uh, I'll tell you what, after that young man bowed his head and accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior at the table in the cafeteria, you talk about getting excited. Man, I was so excited uh, that God would use me to be a witness and to win one of my friends to Christ. And I'll tell you, after that, I just couldn't stop telling everybody I could find. I mean, I told my friends, I carried tracks with me gospel tracks to the pub, to my high school. I carried my King James Bible to all my classes and gospel tracks. And I had wonderful opportunities uh, to witness and to get the gospel uh, to those young people. When I was 17, I started a Bible club, not in the school uh, or on the school property, but I started one in my neighborhood reaching teenagers uh, in the area and uh, saw many young people come to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, are you a faithful witness? He is the faithful witness, uh, but we also should be witnesses. Look at the next thing there in verse number 5. Are you with me tonight? Amen. Amen. How many of you are too hot? Raise your hand. You're too hot. All right. That's more than usual. How many of you are uh, too cold? Well, we got a couple of those. How many are just right? Come on now. All right, that's the majority. Usually wins. Sorry, the ones that are hot and the ones that are cold. The lukewarm ones win. Amen. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the first begotten of the dead. Look at verse 5. It says that not only is he the faithful witness, but he's the first begotten of the dead. Uh, that's another description of our Lord. Did you know it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Jesus is called the first fruit of the resurrection. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Listen, he was crucified for our sins, buried and rose from the dead. One of my favorite songs is the hymn we sing, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He rose again from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. He rose again and because Jesus conquered the grave and he conquered death first, we can conquer the grave and we can conquer death, amen? amen. Jesus has already taken care of it, amen? He's already uh, defeated uh, death in the grave. We don't have to fret. Uh, we don't have to worry if we're saved and we've been born again. We too can conquer death and the grave. Dear Christian, listen, don't fear death. Don't fear death tonight. Sometimes it, uh, we think about dying. Sometimes we think about death and it, and it, puts a, it brings a chill to us. Sometimes we, we, we think about it and we get a little, little worried about it or, or it's, it's so mysterious to us and we get a little bit apprehensive. But I want to say tonight, dear Christian, and I'm preaching to myself, you don't have to fear death because Jesus has already conquered it. Amen. You don't have to fear the grave because Jesus has already He's already defeated it. He is called uh, the resurrection. He is called in this verse the first begotten of 
the dead. Uh, and because he arose, you and I one day will also resurrect uh, unto life eternal. Look at verse 5 again. Look at the next description of Jesus. It says in verse 5, again, it says, And the prince of the kings of the earth. He's called the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, I looked up the word prince. The word prince means royalty, ruler, or sovereign. It also means the close male relative of a monarch, especially a son. Jesus is the prince of the universe. He is the son of Almighty God the Father. In Isaiah, he is called the prince of peace. In Daniel, he is called the prince of princes. In Acts 3.15, he is called the prince of of life. In Acts 5.31, he is called a prince and a savior. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. And then I want you to look down at verse number 8. Look at verse 8 as we continue describing our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And look down to verse 11. He says it again, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is, listen, the beginning and He's the ending. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. If you're wondering why, what does Greek have to do with all this? Well, the New Testament was written in the Greek language by the apostles and those writers of the New Testament uh, inspired by the Holy Ghost of God to write the very words uh, that you and I have today. Now, we're reading it in English, but they wrote it in Greek. It was called Koine Greek. That's the common language the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Greeks at that time. Of the, the whole world, could, the whole Mediterranean world uh, could speak and write Greek. At least most of them could. And uh, the Lord knows what He's doing. Amen? He had the New Testament written in a language that the entire Mediterranean world could understand and read. And uh, he is, God is sovereign. He's so wise. And here he is called Jesus, the Alpha, first letter, and the Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is the first and last, and he is everything in between. He is complete. He is perfect. He is all in all. Look at again in verse uh, 8. Look again in verse number 8. It says this, which is, which was, and which is to come. I want to say tonight that Jesus is eternal. He is forever. John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Jesus is, and He was, and He will ever be. He is eternal. I love Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Uh, aren't you glad that we have a Savior that never changes? Aren't you glad that, that even though society changes and people change and laws change and, uh, and, and, and institutions change and governments change and all of that changes, that our Lord never changes. Amen. He is the same. He, you know, He never changes. He is always good. He is always good. You know, the next time you get discouraged, I want you to just keep reminding yourself, He is good. He is good. Say that a few times. Read it in the Word of God, uh, and it will encourage you, because He is always good. Amen. He is always good. What about the bad times, Pastor? Oh, He's always good. What about the good times? Well, He's always good. What about the trials? He's always good. What about when I don't have any money? He's always good. What about when I'm hungry? He's always good. What about when I'm discouraged? He's always good. What about when I have? Uh, he's always good. What, what about when I don't have? He is always good. He doesn't change. He always loves you. And He always loves me. Amen? He always loves us. Always will. He will never forsake us. 
And His Word never changes. Amen? Amen. He is the which is and the which was and the which is to come. Amen. He is the, all of that. Look again in verse 8, verse number 8. He is called the Almighty. You see that? He's called the Almighty. What do we know about that? Well, Jesus is all-powerful. That means He's omnipotent. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Not only is He all-powerful, but He's all-knowing. In John 21, verse 17, it says that He knows all things. He is uh, omniscient. And He is ever-present. That means He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. How do we know that? Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He is the Almighty One. Uh, Jesus is all of these things. Amen. And uh, the second thing I want to bring to your attention tonight, not only who Jesus is, but what has he done for us? What has he done for us? We see it right here in this chapter. Look back at verse 5. Look at verse 5. The first thing we see there in verse 5 is it says, uh, go down a little bit, uh, go down towards the bottom of the verse, and we see this phrase, unto him that loved us. Unto him that loved us. You see that? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. When we were having the video scavenger hunt, one of the things that we had the video was a, the, the, all the youth group had to sing a song in Spanish. So I taught them how to sing Si Cristo me ama, si Cristo me ama, si Cristo me ama, la Biblia dice así. No matter what language you sing that in, Jesus still loves you. He loves you. He loves all the little children, all the little children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. It says right here, and he, unto him that loved us. John 13, 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, it says. The Lord loved us so much that he was willing to die for us. Just as the verse tells us, we love Him because He first loved us. He loves us so much that He will never leave us nor forsake us. He loves us more than you and I could ever know. He loves you unconditionally. He will never stop loving you. I love the song. It's in our hymn book. and It's a song that goes like this. Oh, how He loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. And oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let me ask you tonight, do you love him? Do you love him? Is he your first love? You know, the Bible talks, in fact, we go a couple chapters over. We won't do that. But if you go a couple chapters over to chapter 3, you find the church in Ephesus left their first love. Their first love used to be Jesus more than anyone or anything. But then for some reason, they, they left that first love. They started loving other things uh, instead of Jesus. Uh, that's why Jesus, uh, when he, uh, uh, before he ascended, and he was talking to Peter there at the, at the, uh, at, at the, 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 sea, uh, the seashore there, the, uh, on the, on the uh, edge there of Galilee, and he said to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me more than these things? Peter, do you, he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter kind of got a little upset. He was getting irritated by it, you know. Uh, Lord, you know I love you. 
But Jesus just wanted to hear Peter say, Yes, Lord, I love you. You know, Peter denied him three times, didn't he? Three times he denied him. Three times he said, I don't know the man. Three times he said, I don't know him. And Jesus wanted to hear him say three times, I love you, Jesus. Amen? Let me ask you, do you love Jesus? Do you love him more than anyone? Do you love him more than anything? Jesus certainly loves us. Have you left your first love? Huh? I hope not. I hope that your first love is the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5 and says this. And the next thing he has done for us, right there in verse 5, look at the last part. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look at that. And he washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is the proof of his love. He was willing to shed his blood for our sins, to sacrifice everything for you and for me. He washed us from our sins in his own precious blood. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We sang this morning, did we not? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Look at, look at the next thing that He's done for us. Are you still with me tonight? Amen. Look at verse 6, verse number 6. And hath made us kings. Stop right there. The King of kings has made us kings. Because we are saved, we have been adopted into God's family. We have been adopted into a royal family. You know, you hear a lot about the royals, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the uh, Prince Charles and William and, and uh, what's, what's the one, Harry, and, and she married that one girl and they left the country and, and all this stuff. You hear all, of, all about the royals, you know. Did you know that you are royalty? If you're saved tonight and you've been born again, you've been born into a royal family. We are spiritual royalty. Look over in chapter 5. I want you to look in chapter 5. Revelation 5 and verse number 10. Look at this. Revelation 5, 5 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth uh, he's made us kings. And you know what? It's time that Christians act like royalty. Amen. It's time that we act like we belong to the king of kings. Yes. Reminds me of a story years ago. I heard this for the first time. It comes from the French Revolution. Back in the late 1700s when there, the revolution broke out in France and, and the common people and the street people were... Well, they were doing kind of like what we're seeing in America. They were burning buildings and looting and rioting, and, and they, were, uh, they were actually uh, getting a hold of some of the aristocrats and the royalty of the, of the country and actually putting some of them to death. Uh, that's how the guillotine uh, death started. And they were taking some of these ro royal people and aristocrats, and they were literally putting them to death. And, and uh, the story says that uh, one of the princes, one of the young princes uh, 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 of the king was actually taken, kidnapped by a bunch of these, uh, uh, these, uh, these people. And, uh, and so they kidnapped him and, and they took him into a bar and they, they set this little boy, he's probably about six years old, and they set him up on, a, on, on the bar, uh, uh, the counter there on the table, and they, and they were trying to get this young man, to this, this prince, to say all kinds of vile things. They were trying to get him to do uh, vile things and so forth. And, and finally, this young prince, he stomped his foot and he said to them, he said, I won't say the things you want me to say. I'm not going to do the things you want me to do because I'm a child of the king. Amen. You and I need to act like we're children of the king. Amen. We don't have to do the things that the world does. We don't have to say the things that the world says and talk like them and live like them and dress like them and act like them because we're children of the King. We belong 
to the King of kings. He's made us kings. And then look at verse 6. Look again, it says, and priests. Not only has he made us kings, but he's made us priests. That's right. Did you know we are our own priests? This is called the priesthood of the believer, which Baptists have believed for, well, ever since Jesus. Amen. And uh, uh, priesthood of the believer. We can come, you and I, boldly to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have access to the Father directly, don't we? In the New Testament, uh, because He has given us the priesthood of the believer. Did you know we can pray for others? We can offer our sacrifices to God. Our praise, our worship, our prayers, our, our, our gifts. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. In Revelation 20, and, and verse number 6, uh, you can uh, flip over there if you'd like to, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, and verse number 6, the Bible says, Blessed and holy is, is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. These are things that the Lord has done for us. I want you to see now what he will do for us. I'm going to show you one thing from this chapter, what he is going to do for us. Look at verse number 7. Look at verse 7. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I want to show you this. This is what he will do for us. He is coming again. First, he comes in the rapture. That's the bridegroom coming for his bride. And if we're saved... We, we belong to His bride. That is the church of the New Testament. He's coming for us. Amen? Yep. And as the Word of God says, it says the Spirit and the bride say come. Secondly, He comes to earth. He's coming to earth, literally. The King is coming for His people. And the Bible says, even so, come, Lord Jesus. He will come in the clouds. He will come mounted on a white horse. He will come with His saints and with His angels. He will break through the eastern gate. He'll touch the Mount of Olives and it will split in two. He will destroy His enemies. He will rule and reign on the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming again. That's what He's going to do for us. And then I close with this last part. What does He look like? Everybody, all, there's a lot of debate going on right now. I'm seeing it on social media, some of the news programs. What did Jesus look like? There's, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter saying that he was black. This group says, no, he was white. This group says, no, he was brown. You know, you got all of these opinions. And what did Jesus look like? What was the color of his skin? I want to show you some things. And I want you to look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. It says, and in the midst... Of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, that's Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot. First of all, we see what he's wearing. Uh, it says the seven candlesticks there. The seven candlesticks represent the churches. Are you with me? And then we see he is clothed with a garment all the way down to his foot. I believe that's a type of robe. Probably... A type of robe that a judge would wear all the way down to the feet. Why? Because Jesus is the judge of the universe. Look again in verse 13. It says, And girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now the word paps means the chest area. I believe that he has a golden garment. Because that represents royalty. He is the king. Look at verse 14. It says his head and his hairs. 
Now here's where you get uh, what he looks like. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Now there's a lot of debate, as I just mentioned, about what Jesus looked like when he was on earth. I don't know exactly what he looked like. I do know this. I know he was born a Jew from a Jewish woman from the tribe of Judah. His skin was probably olive color because he probably looked like a Jew from the Middle East. Uh, now, I'm just guessing. But here in the book of Revelation, we see what he looks like now in heaven. It says that his head and his hairs are white like wool. As white as snow. Why? Because I believe that represents his purity. He is pure as the driven snow and perfect and white as wool. Look at verse 14. And then it talks about his eyes. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. What color eyes does Jesus have? Are they blue? Are they brown? Hazel? No. They are a flame of fire. His eyes represent judgment here. There's judgment that comes from those eyes. I believe this is the color of his eyes as he comes back again to judge the world. I believe that fire comes from those eyes. Judgment, justice, and righteousness come from those eyes. But listen, I also believe that love comes from those eyes. Like when he looked on the multitudes with compassion. Or when he said, let the little children come unto me. Or when he said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Or when he looked at us, you and I with love and compassion and saved us that day. I saw eyes of love. But one of these days he's coming back with eyes as the flame of fire as he judges the world. Look at verse 15. And then we see his feet. It says, In his feet like unto fine brass, and as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. We see here that he has feet of brass, a voice like the sound of many waters. I believe that represents his authority. His authority. Brass has that that uh, connotation, the, the sound of his voice, authoritative and strong. How many of you have ever been to a waterfall like Niagara or someplace like that? And if you ever got close enough to it and you listen to it, it's loud, isn't it? I mean, those waters are so loud. Uh, there's a waterfall in South America. It's on the border of Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. It's called Iguazu Falls. And there's, there's about 20, uh, it, it, probably the size of Niagara, it's probably about 20 Niagara Falls, all in one huge, humongous area. It's amazing. And uh, you can't hardly hear yourself talk when you're, uh, like we, we took a boat ride, you know, like you can do at Niagara, and we got real close to all the falls. And you, it, they were so loud, like thunder crashing. It, as all this water, just, just millions and millions of gallons and, of water crashing down. It was so loud. The Bible says that his voice is like the sound of many waters. Why? Because of his authority. Amen? Because of his strength and his power. But you know what? That same voice that can sound like many waters, that same voice that can sound like thunder is also the same voice that can whisper to us and comfort us. That same voice that when Mary was, was looking for Jesus and all she saw was an empty tomb and then she heard a voice say, Mary. And she looked and she said, Master. He also has that voice, amen? That voice of comfort, that voice of encouragement, that voice that can, that can lift you up uh, when you're down. And uh, so we see his voice, and quickly, and I hasten. And then we see also in verse 16, look at verse 16, and we close with this verse. It says, And he had in his right hand seven stars. 
Now, please go down to verse 20 because you need to look at this. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are, are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the, are the seven churches. Do you know what it means by angels? I, I bet you didn't know that I was an angel. Did you know angel in that word means, in Greek it means messenger, which means pastor. He's talking about the pastors. So he has in his right hand the pastors, but he also has in his right hand the churches. The churches, and we see that he has this in his right What does he have in his right hand? He has the seven stars. Those stars represent the pastors of the churches. And then the golden candlesticks represent the churches. Listen, this shows us how much he cares for his churches. How much he cares for faithful pastors. I believe that the church is in his right hand. He holds the church. Let me, let me say this. If he cares so much for the church, don't you think that you and I should? Huh? Amen. By the way, I preach a lot about not missing church and you know, being in all the services and, 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 and you know, people that, that, that miss services and this and that. But I want to say to you tonight, thank you for being faithful. Thank you. Thank you for coming back on a Sunday night. Thank you. It encourages me. And I know it pleases him. And, and I know sometimes uh, there's good reason to miss a service and sometimes we can't make it or we, we're, we get sick or, or we're out of town or whatever. Uh, but uh, the Lord loves his church and we ought to as well. Amen. Amen. He holds it in his right hand. And then lastly, and I'm done, the, the end of verse 16, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The sharp two-edged sword represents the Word of God. This book, the Bible. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Out of His mouth, His Word comes forth. Amen. The Bible. The Word of God. He is called the Word in John chapter 1. And the Word of God this book that you have in your hand is perfect, is pure, it is powerful, and it is perpetual. That means it will last forever and ever. Amen. And if the Lord thinks His Word is important, shouldn't you? Amen. Lastly, verse 16, the last thing here, and His countenance was as the sun shineth in His strength. His countenance or His face shines like the sun. Why? Because it reflects God's glory. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And we need light in this dark world, don't we? So I close. One of my favorite choruses. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is He. The Lord of Lords supreme throughout eternity. The great I am the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. We've seen who He is, what He's done for us, what He will do for us, and what He looks like all in one chapter to God be the glory and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Lord. You're such a wonderful Savior. You're such a wonderful Lord. And Father, this chapter, as you know, uh, it describes so uh, vividly our Lord and Savior. Help us to glean from this and help us to, uh, to uh, take it into our hearts. And uh, Father, thank you. Tonight, I just wanted to just, just praise the Lord and just exalt our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Help us every day to put him in the forefront, to put him preeminent and the Lord of all. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as the music plays. I don't know how the Lord spoke to you, but if He spoke to you tonight, you come. If you need to receive Him, you come. Maybe you just need to put Him first. You come. Exalt Him in your life. Recognize Him. There's nobody like Jesus. Nobody like our Savior. Father, thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for our Savior and Lord. Help us to leave this place now with Jesus, the Lord of our lives, the Lord of our hearts. And Lord, we ask this in his name. Amen. God bless you. And all God's people said. Amen. And I uh, want to remind you that Wednesday we will... Um, we'll be here at the church for all of our departments, our teen class this Wednesday, kids for, not kids for Christ, the sweat program. Uh, the sweat program, the kids program, and also the Bible study here in the auditorium. So I hope you'll be here for that. God bless you, and uh, you're dismissed. Amen.